Wednesday, August 21. This is the endo meeting. We have a few topics. Uh, uh, Dan comes to us with thoughts about um, supporting built-in modules and where we are on, on the path to making certain packages uh, fall through to built-in modules on certain platforms, um, which we are closer to achieving than I thought and also farther away. Um, and then we have a couple of proposals uh, that need re design review. The, uh, these are coming from Jack Works, one of which is a regenerator runtime um, is handling for the regenerator runtime so that CES is compatible with code that is built, uh, that is compiled down with the with regenerator, regenerator runtime embedded. And the other is ugh, Jack proposed two things. One, uh, it was the reflect metadata taming to also tolerate reflect metadata in the wild. And that one's more or less that Ron Buckton made a proposal for reflect metadata and, uh, and, sh and created a shim for it. That shim is in the wild. The shim is largely not needed anymore, but it's really hard to get rid of in old transitive dependencies. So some tolerance for its existence and some mode of cess is on the table. So those are the three topics. Uh, and let's, um, I thank you, Dan, for putting a link to the matter of the, disc the first topic. And that is, uh, making it so that so the the problem statement is that for a goric contract and this will be potentially a, this will be a uh, there there will be in a similar problem for um for pet demon weblets that uh they embed a copy of everything needed to interact with endo and endo as a library so they each have um, they don't need CAPTP, but each of those each of those weblets and and contracts has a copy copy of EXO and pass style and far and patterns and uh, a whole a whole bunch of code that every contract has is, gets bundled with a duplicate of and we have a mech well we have a mechanism available to us that would allow us to eject or exit to host implementations of those modules if a bundle is created under certain conditions. Um, and uh, so let me show you my show you my work. This one. I, I, I threw together a test yesterday um which demonstrates that a lot of the functionality is to do this is already implemented um and uh we still need to make a choice and it is a difficult choice about whether to even attempt this and i'll explain why um the the crux of it is this is this is a test for conditional host exports and what it does is on the control case, conditional host exports fall through to a pony field fill. This means that I'm going to import a test fixture, this one, fixtures, conditional host exports, yada, 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 index. And I'm expecting that it will export a feature using, uh, and in this case, it's uh, it's faked out. It just exports the string pony fill to reflect the fact that you went down this path. Um, so this bundle, well, this is this is skipping the bundle. This is just executing off of disk, and that's important for reasons. Um, the but uh, the the idea is that this is subsuming the role of both bundle and Im and import bundle. Um, and it it's running the, pon the it's running the pony fields as we expect. But if we inject this condition, um, that is to say, this is a node condition. This is a this is a node-like condition. So this is a condition that will appear in a package JSON later, um, saying if you import this under these conditions, use this implementation instead of the one that you normally would. Um, and I'll come back to this. I haven't seen this comment yet. 
Um, and then at the runtime side, we implement an import hook that says, hey, if you ask for endolib and we're expecting in the test to only get a request for endolib, provide this implementation. Um, and the implement, and this is this is a module descriptor that contains a um, a module namespace object. ZB, you will be note, you will be happy to know that <clears throat> in the current most recent version of CES, uh, CES itself will lift an object into a module namespace if you use a module namespace descriptor, as foretold in the prophecy. Um, I think uh, it doesn't matter for the exit module import hook because we were already doing that uh, with the CES back then because the exit module import hook is not returning the namespace itself. It's returning a record and we could um, we could then pass a execute function that was uh, putting stuff on the namespace. So yeah. we didn't need to do any uh, ugly magic uh, for the brand check. But yeah, this is uh, nicer. <laughs> yeah, then yeah. Uh, we've we've obviated the need to do this outside of CES, basically. Um, it does the it does effectively the same thing. Um, this gets lifted into a virtual um, namespace. Hopefully, preserving uh, opinions about uh, merging object semantics with assignment and keys or properties etc uh, that are present elsewhere so that's i think that's the biggest win for me that i don't have to worry about matching uh those opinions from elsewhere uh i would ask you to take a look and make sure that it is to spec or to need to requirement whatever um okay so this is the fixture uh, the fixtures are all hidden because they're inside of this uh, artificial node underscore modules. The un node underscore modules is there to make to because it, these are not checked. These are not in, these are not installed by npm. They're just installed as these. They are in on on disk as if they were installed by npm for testing purposes. Um, the node modules is uh, it's under node modules so that when you import lib, the node modules convention is that it will look in this directory, then the parent directory, and then the parent directory looking for node modules slash lib or whatever the package name is until it finds a package JSON, and that's what you'll import. Um, so having the node modules there is uh, is helping the, the compartment mapper find its peers. Um, and then we have a package JSON for the app that says that I depend on some version of lib, and then that causes it to link to node modules lib in the parent directory, which has this package JSON. And this is where the meat of the consideration is that if you write in your package JSON these conditional exports, what will happen is that all all existing usage will continue to use the the implementation in place from dot slash index dot js, but um, if you bundle with endolib as one of your conditions, you'll get this implementation instead, and this implementation um, is just re-exporting the feature from uh, from uh, a, a host module. So this. What this does is fall. This falls through to the uh, to the bundles import hook. Whatever whatever was provided as an import hook to import bundle will provide or not the implementation of this, and then that implementation for for Agoric's case would go inside of Zoe. Zoe would be in a position where it says, "Hey, I've got this version of this endo library. I will um, I will provide that instance." here um and uh the interesting thing that this creates is an entanglement of versioning that is kind of subtle that's <laughs> basically no matter basically if you say in your package json uh that uh my implementation would be provided by this host module that means that you have an obligation to be compatible 
um, that you need to maintain a compatibility constraint with that built-in module going forward indefinitely as if it were a host platform. Um, there are ways that we can do versioning, but they are all weird. Um, and ba basically the advantage of not doing this is that every contract gets it gets the implementation that it spec'd out as a version with a semver range in its package JSON. And in order for that to be correct requires us to be more careful. Um, uh, because you might say, hey, I depend on this version of endo patterns, for example, because it has a feature that I need. Um, but then get, and then you write, create a bundle from it, omitting the implementation of that version of patterns. Then you run the contract on the chain and you're going to get possibly what you're going to get, whatever version was most recently, what, what, whatever was bundled into the, into the Zoe contract at the time it was last upgraded, which may not have the feature that you relied upon with your Semver range. So that's the upshot. And the downshot. Yeah, question about all this. First of all, as, as you know, uh, I love uh, the ability to do the exits thing and and to not multiply instantiate uh, packages when we can when we can share them and when it's consistent to share them. Um, I think all of that's really important. Um, uh, the is it possible to would the what would the additional tooling be like, and where would it go to uh, check the Semver constraints and uh, flag or error or something uh, uh, if the um, the the exits the sharing by exits was violating the stated Semver constraints? Yeah, uh, the mechanism would go. Uh, as Richard has suggested, so Richard has made a proposal that we um, that we use URL compatible module specifiers for not just using the endo colon prefix, but providing, um, but actually legitimately carving out a space underneath, um, uh, underneath uh, th that overlaps URL validly. I think external colon was the namespace that is carved out by URL for this purpose. I'm going to be annoyingly pedantic and say, do you mean URL or do you mean URI? I think I mean URI. Richard? Yeah, URI, URI scheme specifically. Okay. Yeah. So there's an-, an No end... difference. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Dan, what did you say? There's no difference. <clears throat> Dan? Oh. Our local authority on the difference between URL and URI having been there. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm I'm actually surprised there's no difference, but we you Dan, you and I can clarify that separately. Um in this in any case, uh what, what we would do is we would have to create a URL scheme or a URI scheme where the version that you want is expressed in the in the module specifier. Um, and then the import hook would be responsible for uh, giving you an implementation that satisfies your Semver constraint. Which is to say this import hook would be obliged to parse this specifier, extract the Semver constraint expressed in it, and then look in its table of implementations and what their Semvers are and give you the most the most recent version that matches the predicate. Wow. Yeah. Or fail. Or fail. Or, yeah. Um, yeah, and that that's that is almost certainly what we would have to do for for a for the endo APIs that are rapidly evolving. You would have to say, I want patterns no less than this. Yeah, there's also, by the way, because um, uh, because of compartments, there's an additional degree of freedom in the uh, share versus duplicate that we need to to we, we you know, is, is is crucial for security, um, uh, which is 
sharing the code versus duplicating the code. And then in those cases where you are sharing the code, there is uh, separately instantiating versus sharing an instance. Um, so under a lava mode style scenario where each package is, um, uh, is loaded into a separate compartment, um, the, uh, you can have the same module source separately instantiated in different compartments, uh, or you can do, um, uh, or, or the, the, instant, the module instance can be shared and neither one subsumes the other because uh, they, um, uh, from a security point, from a, you know, from a security point of view, it, it must reflect programmer intention whether you're sharing the instance or not. Um, uh, if you are sharing the instance, then of course you must be sharing the code. If you're not sharing the instance, if you have separate instantiation, then it's relatively neutral whether you're sharing the code or not. Uh, and right now, the 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 you know the standard packaging systems. Uh, for the JavaScript ecosystem, of course, don't make that distinction. Uh, and they do um, uh, unpredictable sharing or, or uh, versus um, uh, duplication, uh, which you know, is just semantically incoherent, but that's what they do. And, and hopefully we will avoid reproducing any of that nonsense. So the, the comments I had here are sort of how do I use this thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you can you start on the bottom one, which is sort of I hope it's why is app underneath node modules? Uh, this is this is just a, a because this is a test fixture. Um, I'm able to yeah, so uh, coming to think of it, it doesn't need to be. Okay. It, it right. could yeah, I, that wasn't a very interesting thing. It was just a little confusing. Yeah. All right. So then the, the the meat of my question is above. I actually tried to make such a bundle. And... Yeah. Okay. So you used this and you did it with, oh, you did it with this, uh, with, with this very test fixture. Yes. Yes. Okay, you you went to step ahead. Um, this doesn't work yet, <laughs> and I am furiously trying to get ahead of this. So the okay, we, then the, then the claim in the PR is not true, right? Right. It turns out that it is not true. Okay, all right. I, I discovered after proposing this that the higher layers are not there yet. Um, bundle source, uh, oh, and in fact, the lower layers aren't ready yet either. It's this import location shortcut that doesn't create a bundle before trying to to execute the bundle um, eliminated an important intermediate step the, the bundler gets confused if you don't have um, if you don't provide in the modules map an implementation of the exit or a descriptor for the exit and the kind of descriptor for the exit is not wired properly there's a uh, I was chasing this down and I got as far as that uh, record module descriptors are not recursive in CES, and that appears to be necessary for this case. Um, okay, that... well, this test clearly passes, but it doesn't do what's on the tint on the label, so. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, okay. it's not it's not going through bundle source yet, and it's not going through import bundle. Import bundle needs a two-line change to, to support this, um, to basically thread the import hook. <laughs> it's as an option from the porcelain down to the plumbing. Um, that's easy. Uh, what surprised me was that bundle source is going to require more. Um, and it'll probably require more command line flags or a different command line flag, like a like an exit flag. Um, and the exit flag would provide both the condition and whatever um, whatever thunk whatever, like a descriptor for the exit so that the bundler doesn't say, hey, I can't find this. Um, yeah. So my um, use case had been contract bundles, but um, you just mentioned the um, 
caplet bundles also uh, are would benefit from this, right? That's right. Yeah. So when you get to the point where you can actually shrink a caplet bundle, please let me know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, because then I don't have to go all the way out to Agoric SDK to validate it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Hey, that means that I'm going to touch the demon. Aaron, can I can I work on the demon a little bit without? <laughs> you have my approval. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah. The demon is going to be useful for, as a test bed for a number of things that I had forgotten to, that this was one of them. Um, it's going to be useful also for doing a debugger and also de and it will ideally also be useful for um, validating OCAP and uh, when we start, when someone starts writing an OCAP and implementation, and I would like that to be in the endo repository, or at least one of them. Um, so that we can do that kind of validation. Um, right, and sort of small commercial there. Yeah. Um, Mark, did you know that I have um, escrow working in Goblin Scheme? I did not know that. No, I do. Well, I... I'm not even sure I understand what that means. The the um, Zoe two formalization spike that I was doing with Daphne yes. and such. Yes. Um, ACL two okay. is is a Lisp thing, and um, Goblins is sort of a Lisp th thing, and so and Goblins actually has promises and stuff like that. So anyway. Well, so but but ACL two is pure Lisp with no side effects, right? That's right, and the. We've gone beyond the 20 second commercial. Can I keep going? I would certainly like you to keep going. Is any <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if you want, you can bring up the 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 spike. Uh I forget the name of it. Uh it is uh PR 8184 in the SDK. Then why don't uh, you share since the oh right. Uh Right. So there's a long line of research about exactly how Zoe escrow works and formalizing it and stuff like that. And I've tried a few different things. And yes, uh, it's common list because it has no side effects. It's a very short explanation of ACL2. And they've formalized enormous amounts of processor stuff and all kinds of other stuff. And then... Um, I was wondering if there were actor libraries. So promises are kind of not something that the formal systems community spends a lot of time on. You won't find a lot of, or I haven't found a lot of stuff about promises in the formal systems literature. Um, but I was wondering if there was actor libraries for ACL2. And then um, I realized, so the, the way Goblins works is the next state of your actor can, it, it, you know, you're kind of encouraged to make it a pure function. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha, right. Gobl Goblins is layered in such a way. I see. Okay, good. So, um, and so, what's it? So are you actually using ACL2 on this? No, I haven't gotten to that point. Um, but so you're going to prove that you can make it work first in goblins and then take a scheme dialect and translate it to the other scheme dialect. Right. But here's the, whatever it is, 30 line oh my uh, God. escrow thing written is goblins. And then it's got a, there's a certain amount of test stuff that's working. And I've also got property testing of uh, amount properties. So using the sort of, quick check style stuff to these are the sorts of things I would prove in in ACL2. Okay. And uh is the is chainmail slash necessity work of uh I noticed you you citing it at the uh, at the on the readme page at the top. Uh is that influencing how you're going about doing this at all? That's influencing at the thought level. Um, That's what uh, I'm asking. 
I'm not sure where that comes in. Okay. I'm going to get there. So. Awesome. This is awesome. So is that, where is it? There's the sort of checklist of. Wow. And the, the ERTP includes uh, um, semi-fungibles? Uh, yeah, well, yes, in that um, the there's just an amount math thing as long as it meets those. I haven't written the semi-fungible amount math layer, but the, the, the escrow thing, all it cares about is that there's an amount math thing that has, you know, Okay. Come out with ad and such. And uh, do you, so where do the specifications come from? Do you separately write specification code that you prove the implementation or does the implementation serve as an executable specification? Currently I'm doing this, this uh, property testing stuff. I see, I see. So I write the property like this and it, you know, it runs a hundred cases and says, oh, well, I didn't find any problems. Okay, okay. So, so like the, amount math algebraic property would be written out as property testing invariance. Right. Okay, cool. And presumably this ports to ACL2 trivially. Very cool. Neat. All right. Um... I, I gather have we have we chased the topic to the ground for the um ejecting bundles? Uh I suppose I should summarize. Um ejecting host modules from bundles. The mechanism exists at the compartment layer. Um then and the mechanism is tri trivial to thread through to import bundle. There are complications in bundle source that will require changes in bundle source and cess in order to complete the vision and it mostly amounts to um figuring out where the exits are at bundle time um okay. changes to cess what what do you have in mind there uh, changes to the module loader um okay. vocabulary of module descriptors that it accepts it will need to become more liberal got it and the the caplet target does that live in any issue no, definitely not. That's that's your idea during this meeting. <laughs> we should definitely uh, I can I can create an issue to track that as an intermediate step uh, as uh, to vet the um there's there is an issue in agoric SDK tracking um uh ejecting specifically far or eventual send, I think eventual send um from bundles, but that is just an example of an issue. That's like a starting point. So, uh, so is so the exits are they going back to the to the you know the the two level issue that I raised? Are is this a issue of sharing or not with regard just to the sources, or is it also an issue of sharing or not with regard to the instances? And is there an ability to separate those two? This is about sharing instances. Okay. The... Yeah, practically, the way I would see it for contracts is that the ZCF would ZCF has a has a eventual send E, right? Mm -hmm. And and it would just provide that to the contract instead of the contract parsing the entire eventual send module. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we get. Uh, so this mechanism is only suitable for host modules that are hardened and pure. Um, yeah, so, and, mm -hmm. so will we be so with regard to the existing um, uh, weird thing that we're doing to enable live slots to endow ZCF and the contract with the live the the past style of created by live slots, uh, we could in we using this, we could instead, just have past style, the past style of package be an exit that uh, got the instance provided by live slots. Is that correct? Uh, so word for word, yes. The 
the wiggle is that the whether to have an whether to exit to the host provided module is uh, configurable to the contract bundler. They have the contract bundler has to say, "I want to share an instance with my host." That's that's fine because there's there's no uh, you're not breaking anything. You know, the contract author isn't breaking anything else if they decide they want their own copy of past dialogue. They're only right. making their own life harder. They're not making anybody else's life harder. Right. And the um, the upshot of which is that, yes, this mechanism could be used to eliminate an instance at runtime for contracts that opt in, but the mechanism for allowing, uh, the mechanism for allowing eval twins um, needs to remain in place because it's volitional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, the 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 thing. Yeah. It's it would still be allowing eval twins. It would not be forcing everybody to live to live with eval twins forever. It would enable you to avoid eval the eval twin problem, which is just awesome. It actually enables us to do OCAP programming for the first time. <laughs> yeah to, to an extent um to an extent it's not going to work for um for it, this trick will only work for bundles that the the host and guest contractually arrive to use together yep that's adequate yeah okay uh, I think that uh, needs design is for one I have to stomp out all of the bugs for bundle source and I was running into some corners the um the um remaining there there would there remains questions for this audience about whether we should engage with this with Zoe and to design the module specifier namespace um that we will use for host modules. And I can jam with Richard and Dan on that out of band, but that's that still needs design. And I am increasingly convinced that uh, that uh, the design direction Richard proposes needs to be needs to be what we do. Uh, which and it is totally un uh, totally unfortunate that uh, that node <laughs> node didn't go in a URL URI extensive like and it just didn't didn't reuse a sub uh, a reserve space of uris for node colon fs for example de facto they probably have it though and i it, it can be fixed after the fact by getting a registration but should have been considered ahead of time and i i don't know if it was but either way they went with the squatting approach. Well, it's what Grace Hopper taught us to do. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, I I didn't. I tried to interpret that, but I didn't put it put it together. What is what Grace Hopper told us to do? Uh, to ask uh, ask for oh. forgiveness. So not for permission. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't know that came from Grace Hopper. I might no. What? Yeah, yeah, that was Grace Hopper. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, Grace Hopper also gave us the um, speed of light is an inch and a half. She had her her physical representation. I had, I had an assistant scoutmaster who got to witness that demonstration in person uh, when I was a kid, which uh, was a pretty special connection. Um, she did it. She did that demo on Letterman, <laughs> so you can you can go see it yourself if you want. If you want, <laughs> I'm actually unfamiliar with. I mean, I remember the the speed of light thing, but I don't. I didn't know there was a demonstration. Oh, she, she took her inch and a half long wire to uh, with her when she got to speak to David Letterman. Or oh, just showing just showing the the wire, not but not demonstrating that it was oh, that, that light actually. Yeah, it's very very difficult to observe. 
<laughs> All right, <Yeah>. like faster. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me um, let me share some. Uh, the design review stuff. Some of this will be relatively straightforward. It looks like in the intervening time, um, Mark approved this design as is, and it has since merged. But uh, Mark, can you read us in on what we're doing about regenerator run re regenerate, run regenerator runtime taming? Yes, uh, we added a flag um, named um, something like. Uh, Legacy regenerator runtime taming. Yeah, um, uh, where it's the the default setting is safe, in which case nothing changes from what we're used to. Uh, but the uh, unsafe ignore the 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 setting unsafe ignore is one where the uh, the, the 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 change that it makes, which turns out surprisingly, at least to both Chris and I. Um, the change that it makes that enables the legacy regenerator runtime um, uh, to work under hardened JavaScript is only that assigning to the iterator property of iterator prototype uh, is silently ignored. Uh, this legacy version of, of regenerator runtime or this legacy version range of regenerator runtime uh, as it shows on the code on the screen um, is assigning, is, is redundantly assigning to iterator prototype dot symbol iterator um, a function that just returns this, which is what the existing um, uh, uh, built-in function already does. So it was just completely a pointless thing that, that the legacy regenerator runtime was doing, but it was doing it. And the result was that under hardened JavaScript, it was throwing at that point in the regenerator runtime initialization. Um, uh, and with this flag, we replace that particular property with something very much like the um, uh, enable property overrides uh, getter setter, but the normal getter, the normal enable property overrides getter setter, if you assign to the object itself on, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the own property on the object itself, it throws because it's trying to emulate a frozen property that does not suffer from the override mistake. Uh, over here, uh, with this setting, uh, that particular assignment uh, is just silently ignored. Um, uh, but any other, uh, with regard to any other assignment, i.e. to an object that inherits from this object, uh, it just behaves like the enable property overrides, uh, the, the thing that, that uh, repairs the override mistake. Uh, and that is it. And initially, both Chris and uh, Jack thought that this setting was safe. Uh, so they named the property, they, they named the option setting differently. And I pointed out that silently ignoring an assignment, given that we can't verify, or that we, at least we don't verify, that it's this particular assignment. Um, uh, is unsafe because it means that there's that the program might be trying to do some other assignment for some other purpose, and that will get ignored as well. And silently ignoring an assignment and allowing code to proceed as if nothing bad happened uh, was exactly an unsafety that ES3 suffered from and that yes, and that existing sloppy mode continues to suffer from. And um, because it enables control flow to proceed um, uh, onto into code paths that assumed that the assignment succeeded. Um, so that's why silently ignoring an assignment is, should be considered unsafe. And that's that's I think the entire the entirety of what we did here. Awesome. I think that I, I'm convinced and can I can make that case going forward. The um, 
I, th I believe that the reason why regenerator runtime is doing this redundant assignment is because it is designed to run on systems for which it is not redundant <laughs> worth on, on JavaScript that predates the introduction of iterator. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Um, can I add a potentially silly question? Feel free to dismiss. Um, the value uh, for the setting uh, is unsafe dash ignore. My question is, what's unsafe about it? It's unsafe because it will cause any assignment to this property on this object to be silently ignored, allowing control flow to proceed as if the assignment succeeded. So this was the unsafety that ES3 had that, e, that, e, that ECMAScript sloppy mode still has. And this is, it was to repair this unsafety that we introduced strict mode uh, and we introduced, well, we, it, strict mode as a whole it repaired many mm -hmm. unsafe, but one of them was to make failed assignments throw so that, so that control flow would not proceed into code that assumed the, sign, uh, the assignment succeeded. Understood. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a strange kind of unsafety. In this case, it's not it's not that it enables someone to escape confinement. It's unsafe because it allows them to proceed with on false assumption. Right. And and it's also and it's an even weirder kind of unsafety because it says because presumably under hardened JavaScript, the only such code is an attack. <laughs> no, no, it could be an innocent mistake. It could be it could it could be that you had other code that was written not for hardened JavaScript that happened to have a control flow path to try to do this assignment for whatever internal reason. And it should fail under hardened JavaScript, preventing the code from continuing past the violated assumption. Right. So it just might be, you know, not code not written to run, you know, was unaware of hardened JavaScript that somebody tried to run under hardened JavaScript that otherwise succeeds at running under hardened JavaScript, except for this obscure case. Yeah, uh, we will probably, uh, we will find ourselves explaining that a lot. And I, did we catch, catch? no, 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 that's right. I, we, we landed this without, uh, without documentation. Right. And I, I've requested a, a circle back to update lockdown and news, and that that explanation belongs in lockdown MD for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, and do I need to make an issue for this? Uh, since um, I would let's see, is Jack here? No. Okay. Um. Yeah. Sure. I'll come back to that. All right, we've got 10 minutes. It's probably not enough to go through this, but Jack also propose, proposed um, tolerating uh, reflect.metadata. Um, reflect.metadata is the uh, Ron Buckton's proposal that has since languished, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are old libraries that we cannot quite erase from the ecosystem that rely upon it. And... Um, we have been going on the assumption that we can that we can just get the ecosystem to heal around this by publishing new versions that don't rely upon it, but that's taking too long for Jack's taste. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, so so Jack and I have have you know gone back and forth on on this thread on this PR thread that you're looking at, um, and he you know his initial. Um, you know, his initial draft was really quite invasive and complicated. Uh, and I think he's accepted um, my proposed uh, simplifications, uh, plural, uh, but the, uh, the uh, you know, in terms of his comments on this thread, but I don't think that the PR itself has yet been revised to reflect those simplifications. All right. So Jack does not need any feedback from us in order to make progress. In short, uh, okay. well, I, I should talk through. I mean, I can talk through with this group right now um, what those, you know, what the simplified form is that I think Jack and I now have agreement on, um, uh, which is basically that um, 
uh, that the start compartment have um, you know under a, an enabling flag uh, that the start that the reflect namespace object in the start compartment um, start out mutable and that the flag itself do nothing other than that, just enable it to be mutable. Uh, and what that allows is for this uh, reflect metadata taming to, um, uh, to happen on in the start compartment after lockdown. It does not by itself endow other compartments with that dangerous reflect object, because you know it is dangerous if you try to make it a shared primordial, but um, the it allows the pattern of explicit endowment by, uh, from the start compartment to created compartments in just the same way that we, for example, enable the code in the start compartment to enable constructed compartments to have the a dangerous math object or the dangerous date object. You just do it by explicit um, endowment. And that's just a choice the code in the start compartment can make. There's no reason for a further policy flag on the, on, okay. as a locking option. So a future version of CES will introduce a shared reflect uh, namespace, shared intrinsic that is different from the start compartments reflect. Right, that's right, that's right. It, the, yeah. it, this requires the SAR compartments reflect to be a distinct object. Uh, and that's what we do with math and, and date. We just, we do it likewise with uh, reflect, but additionally, um, we have uh, the, the, the reflect be, be not frozen. Uh, they reflect specifically in the SAR compartment, be not frozen at the end of lockdown. All right, sounds like a plan. And we're a little bit over time. I'll um, well, let's let's cut the meeting there, and I'll socialize this with Jack to make sure he sees we had made notes. <laughs>